whether it's music or fashion or fine art, whatever, like I'm just I'm just trying something and I'm and I'm losing track of time because I'm just enjoying the process of learning. Mm. And I think that that's why I've found success. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today we find ourselves in the presence of the one and only Trouble Andrew. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Very excited yeah. to be here. Obviously, we're not in our usual studio. We decided to come check out the uh, the art space and everything. Just, yeah. you know, figured that we should add a, a visual aid to remind everybody exactly how this fucking brain of yours works. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, welcome. No. Glad you, glad you made it. Happy to be here. Yeah. So, uh, can we start with the early days? Because uh, you have a pretty crazy story that led up to how you got here today. But uh, tell us a little bit about your childhood. Sure. Uh, I grew up in Nova Scotia, like out in the country. Um, I think, you know, my window to art and everything that I learned about was through skateboarding. And I was lucky to, my mom would like always have like an older dude, like renting a room or whatever at the house. And just randomly, like those few guys that were there were like punk rock guys that skated and just were always bringing me home like Dead Kennedy's tapes or taking me to the skate contest up in the city or, um, and that really, I think just gave me a viewpoint, like a, just a new way to look at the world. I think right. skateboarding really, uh, there's no kind of right way to do it or wrong way to do it. And there's so much like art and culture that's just attached to it. so. I was really lucky in that way. And my mom worked at the ski hill, like it was literally like a ski hill. It was maybe like 300 vertical feet and it was right down the street. So like she was there selling tickets. So like after school, I would pull up and, and snowboard every day and in the winters, cause like winters were rough and you couldn't really skate. So and, around what age did you start to get introduced to this? And was there a lot of like culture going on in that area or do you feel no, like you no, just got like super in lucky the, yeah no i got super lucky because it was like kind of in the middle of nowhere in a sense like it was uh we were on kind of a back road um and there wasn't like a skate park there wasn't really like a scene unless you went into the city and it was like still very small then i was about uh maybe like 10 or 11 when when that started happening i started skating when i was maybe eight and uh started snowboarding when i was about 10. right so you got introduced to like punk and skateboarding kind of all as one cohesive thing it wasn't like separate things that you got into yeah not at all it was it was all one thing and and I just watching like the skate videos or the snowboard videos i was like learning about music that i would have never knew about you know from being where i'm from the you know, country on the radio and, and like, so I was learning about like Bad Brains and, and uh, Black Flag and, and like a bunch of underground bands too, like McRad and, and Sub Society and a bunch of stuff that really influenced me like to this day, you know, like all of those videos, I was kind of seeing the world through those videos, like seeing the cities, seeing like mountains and all this stuff that really drew me and was like a magnet to like find that in my life later on. Right, because I remember, I remember having that experience from BMX and skate videos too, where it's like everything, there's so many different parts to this that you have to understand. Like, what are what is all this music? What Like, how the hell are they capable of doing these crazy ass tricks? Like the the design of it, the, 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 the even just like the graphic design on the package, yeah. Oh, yeah, shit totally. like that. Like, there's just so Fashion. many. Yeah, and when you see that and you're like a, 15 year old kid that you know is wearing clothes from fucking old navy or like you only know about so many bands because they're on the radio or whatever it just splits your fucking head in two and all of a sudden it's like there's infinite shit that i want to figure out about what these 25 year old dudes are getting into yeah exactly exactly and i think that i was really lucky to have that and to experience that and uh you know learning about like you know like mark gonzalez and like these kind of guys that that when you look at it, it's, I think like, you know, when you talk about like skateboarding or snowboarding, surfing, BMX, whatever, it's, it's, it's more of like a martial art than like a sport. It takes like athletic ability to do it, but 
it's really like a culture and just a way of life, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I was really attracted to that. I got like, I never was into team sports and stuff. I got turned off like really young. I tried to join like a soccer team and didn't, I was maybe like eight or something. It was like not a big deal team. It was just like, and they were like, no, you didn't make the cut. And I'm like, what do you mean? I can't play and have fun. And then I went to see my, my older brother. He's four years older than me, Robin. He was at the um, parking lot at the school with a couple of his friends. He got a skateboard and they were all like encouraging each other. And, and I was like, man, I want to do that. And mm -hmm. then, you know, with the older guys that were around, I just, I really fell into that hard, you know? Yeah, like the competitive nature of sports didn't really click with me as a kid. And then once I realized that bike riding and skateboarding and shit was more like creative and that there wasn't a right or wrong way to do it, yeah. that just like spoke to me so much more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what's, and I think I've chased that same idea my whole life, you mm -hmm. know, with that's how, I became an artist and a designer and everything that I do is just finding my way to do it and finding my style and and without any training, you know, whether it's music or fashion or or fine art, like whatever, like I'm just I'm just trying something and I'm and I'm losing track of time because I'm just enjoying the process of learning. Mm. And I think that that's why I found success, you know. When you look back at that time period, I feel like some people are just attracted to the pure sport of it. You know, mm -hmm. they want to toss themselves down handrails and figure out what they're capable of or whatever. Seeing the way your career has played out, that you've clearly been able to dip into so many different uh, elements of the culture, including the design and everything. When you look back at that time period, were you the person who was also like studying the brand's logos and caring about the packaging on the VHS tape? Like, was that something that always stood out to you? Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, we didn't have the internet you know mm. so it was like anything that you could get your hand on a zine or a, a, a vhs tape a, a cassette tape you know like you're just studying all of that stuff it's your access it's your window to that world you know thrasher magazine like um all of that it was it was what we had to that's the only access we had, you know? Mm. So it's like, you look at it, you play it over and over and over. And it's even those tapes, you know, watching those videos, it's, you watch them religiously. Like there's, you don't, it's, you don't have like a whole pool of content that you can just keep like clicking and finding new stuff. It was, yeah. So I was diving deep into it. And, um, you know, once I got sponsored, like my first sponsors, I was probably about like 12, and this was snowboarding to start? Yeah, okay. so snowboarding kind of like took off. I remember my friend, us being like, yo, like, because I was competing skating. Like, I would go to this, uh, I would compete like um, locally and stuff uh, when I was around like 12 or so. And um, so it was going to be like skateboarding or snowboarding, but obviously being from Canada, it's just like, it was just easier to, and I was just translating all that energy from skateboarding into snowboarding and um, so I got, I started competing and doing well and locally, nationally, then, you know, doing World Cups and stuff. But I, I picked up my first couple of sponsors and then immediately it was like, I was already like my first design work. Like, I, cause I remember writing letters to them like, oh, I just learned like backside 540s or whatever. And like, here's a t-shirt design. And I was like, you know, reinterpreting things that were just in my life. Like there was this logo, it was a popsicle pete like popsicle logo that i i flipped for west beach which was actually like my first sponsor mm. um and uh and so yeah i guess that that's kind of been a part of my dna the whole time is just to like reimagine things bring bring something new to it that's so crazy to think back on that time period and what might have become of those creative instincts that you had because you know, like sending fucking sponsor me tapes and yeah. te like t-shirt designs to brands and stuff. It's so crazy because nowadays, I mean, what does that energy turn into? I mean, are you a kid with a fucking fan page on Instagram or doing some sort of like weird YouTube edits or do you end up starting your own brand or do you end up, you know, writing an email to some influencer and you end up kind of working under them or whatever, like the pathways that kids take are so much more varied. Whereas at that time you really had nothing 
to do besides to sort of like pitch your services to an established brand. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a big shot in the dark for me, you know, like being from where I was from and, but it, it happened, you know, it's just like, I think even with the tools kids have now with technology, it's rad because you can actually connect with a person, a brand, whatever. You can actually educate a brand on something that they don't even know is, about themselves you know mm. what i mean that you're like oh this could be like a whole new thing and and i think that 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 direct communication is is rad you know like if you have a vision and, and or you can just go out and do it mm. and and that's kind of what i did later in my life too with just like just doing it first and then like affecting the brand and and making some kind of wave so that it's noticed and and felt you know there's nothing that gets me more like inspired or excited than the the many times in my life where I've watched like a BMX DVD or, or a skate video or whatever. And it's like clear that these are some young ass kids and that they're just good as fuck at the whole thing. Like their filming yeah. is sick. The, yeah. Their music taste is sick. They know what tricks are cool, et cetera. That will just give you this feeling of like, holy fuck, like I'm in for 10 plus years of like whatever this person's going to bring to the table creatively like that's such a amazing feeling just realizing that kids have that in them still you know yeah yeah and they got phones you don't even need to have the the mm. friend with the vhs camera you know it's like Facts. you got you everybody can film each other and uh there's all kinds of tools and that's so exciting that you can um but yeah back then i was like i would find any any way to make it happen you know with mm. my own you know filming from vhs to vhs player to like make a video edit and like you know taking my friend's band song or like whatever just just making it happen and and making my version of what you know i was learning about like on a higher level through like powell videos or santa cruz or like you know were skating and snowboarding like equal to you or were you more into one or the other and then the snowboarding just happened to be the thing that was really working out i think it i think it's equal i think that like um skateboarding was definitely like my first love and and uh is that whole style that i developed as a young skater i brought that to snowboarding you know but definitely you know having the ski hill down the down the road and and just going there after school and that's all i could think about you know and it was uh and it just kind of happened fast and i ended up um you know competing and then like dropped out of school and and my, my mom gave me like just a crazy amount of freedom as a kid which really? is i was really lucky in that way to like be going on these road trips with like dudes that were like 19 20 when i was 12 or whatever you know right. that that really got me out so that by the time I was like 14 or 15 I was you know almost turning pro by the time I was 16 17 I was like won my first like big pro contest beat out all the like it was like an invitational it was called the super session it was in Sweden and I almost it was kind of like I got lucked out because uh somebody got hurt I just gotten a new sponsor they called me like, hey, somebody got hurt. We want to put you in this contest. And it was against like the heavy hitters like Peter Line and Daniel Frank and Igmar Bachman, all these guys that were like kind of the gods at the time. And um, and I was a nobody and I just pulled up and and won the contest. I was like 16 or 17. It was like $50,000. And what? that that changed everything because I went back home and it was like, then I was like, man, I, I'm going to do this. And then my mom was like, yeah. In yeah, retrospect, did you kind of get lucky or were you just actually nice as fuck and undiscovered? No, I was de definitely nice for sure. But I just I got lucky in the sense that they weren't the on their A game. No, no, no. Hell oh, no. Really? Like I, I, I definitely delivered. But it was just the way I got lucky was to get into that kind of contest yeah. because it was invitational only. It wasn't like open to whoever. It was the top 25 riders in the world, you know, mm. so. I was just the new kid on the scene that luckily this guy, Ben Proust, that br brought me on to Solomon at the time, which he had just gotten his job and was like, I believe in you. You should go to this contest. I can get you in. And that was where I really lucked out. I had somebody believing in me. And that's where I feel like I've been fortunate in my life the whole way along is just to, as much as I was missing a lot of other things in my life probably. and but 
I had people around me that that you know older guys and stuff that were like I believe in you you right. know you got to do this and I'm like I knew I I could do it but I needed that that kind of that help you know on a, on a purely physical level can you contrast and compare like rolling down the street on a skateboard versus like rolling down a mountain on a snowboard because it's it's got to be very different sensations like one you could hit a fucking pebble and be going head first into the ground and one you're pretty much just like smoothly gliding through there it, like I, i've never really got in an in, avalanche you know? right well i never got into that <laughs> shit but i always have like looked at it it just looks like so fun and just smooth oh, and nice in it comparison is. to skating or bike riding where you're like it's, it seems like more like guaranteed pain in that right. shit, right? Um, well, I mean, it's guaranteed. I mean, on the level of like when you're a pro, it's guaranteed pain. You're definitely yeah. like, you know, I've broke my back, broke all my ribs, broke my arm, broke my legs. Like I've, you know, fucked myself up quite a bit. But um, it's just because it's high impact, you know, mm. it's like snow is soft. But when you're going like 60 and you're flying over a 100 foot gap, yeah. you know, like it's not it's not um but yeah i mean skateboarding's gnarly like skateboarding is the gnarliest to me i mean they're both gnarly you can die doing both you mm -hmm. know so that's the way i see it same with surfing same with bmx it's like when you're pushing it on that level you know i've had friends die doing it so it's it's uh it's it's different because you're out you know if you're skating a ramp or you're skating down the street i mean obviously the contrast to like being in the mountains and that kind of stillness of the mountains and quietness right. is is what i would say that the difference is where it's like really peaceful but when you're when you're throwing down it's uh it can definitely which one do you prefer like the stillness of, of being off in the mountains or like just the hubbub of being in the city and like you know just being out skating or riding bikes it's like you can, you have to kind of like crave chaos in a way because you're right. putting yourself in an environment where a fucking homeless guy is going to start screaming at you and that's just part of what you're doing out there for the day right right um well i mean i don't know if i prefer one or the other but i'm super grateful that i have both and that balance in my life um and as a kid growing up in the country and all the stuff that i was learning about through videos i definitely was attracted to the city and you know post snowboarding i ended up like you know moving to new york and being there i lived there in brooklyn for 16 years and and just like all of the i think what i love about being in a city is just like the world is in front of you mm. you know you can uh learn so much immediately just by walking out the door and and so many different cultures and way of life and and um so much visually happening and i think that the mountains is something that is really peaceful and powerful as well um it's just so i'm happy that i i get to kind of like tap into both worlds you know it definitely probably makes you like a more complete artist or human that you have like so much experience with both being that they're similar but so different yeah definitely yeah, yeah. I, I mean it's they've both given so much to my life you know for sure so when you were going on all these trips with like 20 year old plus dudes and you're like 14 or 15 i've seen this dynamic of bmx where the fucking young kids get turned out like super young and they're getting right. drunk as fuck and smoking weed and hooking yeah. up with girls was did you have that kind of experience where all of a sudden you had to grow up real fast i mean I think, I mean, I was definitely exposed to all that. And I think that, uh, yeah, it's funny. I just transferred all these old tapes and I saw like the footage of, you know, the dudes I was rolling with and how they, you know, and yeah, d I mean, I guess I did. I guess <laughs> I did. I think that in a way I kind of like paced myself just because I was exposed to so much chaos and, and that kind of lifestyle that I think I was always looking at it. And going, it definitely sucked me in a bit in my life, but I think that I also had my guard up a little bit and and uh, didn't get too fucked up along mm -hmm. the way, you know. And that's how I've I'm still here, you know. So when you take that big W in that contest, how does your life change from there? And do you just get like laser focused on like, okay, I'm gonna be the fucking boss in this shit? Yeah, well, because that was my opportunity to leave school, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so I was like, I'm not going back to this and I don't want to. School to me was so much like it was just 
I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't get anything from it. I don't really have any good memories of it. And, and so it was my opportunity to make it happen. I'm like, I'm not going to fuck this up. And I really did get really focused and, um, and use con uh, competing as like a way to kind of get out into the world mm -hmm. and, and get that support and make money. Um, and that's what allowed me to stay out there doing it. Uh, and then I was starting to like provide for my family, you know, at a young age. And um, a little later on, I think like the contest stuff kind of burnt me out a bit. And then I really got into like making my video part, kind of where I discovered all this stuff, watching the videos and picking the song and like working all year to like, cr like put together a part that I felt pushed the sport, pushed the, the whole shit forward but um it represented me and and that's the stuff that i'm probably the most proud of right because that's interesting that you weren't really attracted to the the tennis and the football and everything so much but then in comparison like like at that time i'm assuming snowboarding like is kind of like skate and bmx where it's like at that time the focus was competing and there was like a small pocket of people that like weren't Doing at all videos. interested in yeah. that and now it's the total opposite where like, if you were to look at everybody who got a paycheck from skateboarding this year, I'm going to assume that, like, 80% of them are, like, street skaters and people put shit on their Instagram. And then you have, like, a, a chunk of people who are in the Olympics and doing contests and stuff. But I think it's probably, like, a smaller percentage these days. Yeah, I would imagine so. I think that um, – I just think, like, the contest is just – it's rad. It's more – it's kind of like I would say it's, like, performing live. It's mm. that – that moment to like really throw down and, and, but doing a video part is more like making your album, mm -hmm. you know, where you get to like really put everything into it. It's not all about just that moment. It's about your whole season. So I really was attracted to that. And I think that, uh, yeah, cause I was just contests is, it just becomes repetitive and just, I'm always, if I feel like I'm being repetitive, I want to just break off and try something new. And that's right. how I've done with art and everything. Just exper uh, like experiment and try try something new. When you, you know? were fully in the zone with like just trying to be the dopest snowboarder, were you just like practicing all the fucking time? Did it just feel like training? Um, I don't think so. Just because I really, truly loved it. So like I still, uh, I think it was just, doing the contest doing the same run mm. or something like that where i didn't have time to like go out and learn something new because i was going from one contest to the next contest and it's like being on tour you know mm. you're just going and you're running through that set you know and and i think after a while it's exciting at first but after a while i just it just didn't feel i didn't feel that excitement anymore and i think that's where i always have the courage to like shift gears and try something new and push myself in a different direction so that i can find that excitement again you know and so was this the early days of your video part and snowboarding being a priority or was there this already like an established thing and, and what year was this when you first put out your first part uh my first video parts probably came out like uh dang I don't even, it's like a life ago, it seems like to me now. <laughs> because, okay, in case people haven't noticed, me and you have a weird similarity where you have this whole snowboarding part of your life and I have this whole BMX part of our life. And probably like 90% of people at home don't really know much about either. And so it's it's always kind of weird to know so much about the subculture that you spend your 20s or your teens on or whatever. And then to end up in a different place where it doesn't really matter that much to people, but they all, but they know you have this life experience. Yeah. They're just kind of blind to it. Yeah. Um, I guess it would be, I, I think I was probably about maybe 20 or something. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't, but that was just, uh, um, it just kind of like I was still doing contests and then I kind of like started like and then, you know, and then I just kind of stopped doing contests for like the last half of my career. I guess I was just doing the video parts and, and your sponsors were cool with this. Oh, they yeah, for sure. Because it, it definitely like I pushed myself and I did stuff on film that 
definitely like I was getting the, the closing part of the video, you know right. what I mean, or the cover of the magazine. And what what would you describe as like what you were bringing to the table, snowboarding wise? Because I I've heard it from other people, and I heard it from you a little bit that like you were very very well known at the time for having like an extremely unique style and kind of bringing a lot of different shit to the table. How would you explain that to a layman like myself who doesn't really understand that much about snowboarding? Um, was it a I just, style I guess thing I, or Yeah, it was tricks? definitely like a style thing and a big mountain freestyle thing, like just mm. pushing it, like hitting the biggest jumps and trying to go the biggest at the time and, and bringing that skate style to snowboarding and not being on some you know athletic like gymnast vibes you know i was mm. more bringing like and also even on the fashion stuff like i was i started my own brand with one of the companies i was riding for burton snowboards we started this it was like me and six other riders started a company um under that brand and it was like we just wanted to bring like what we were wearing in our lives to the mountain because that before that it was like really alpine influenced and skier right. influenced and we wanted to like wear jeans and like flannels and whatever you know we wanted to dress like on the mountain how we were dressing skateboarding right so you know i was bringing a bit of that too and um and then pairing that with just trying to go the biggest and and pushing it you is know? wearing jeans inconvenient on a snow-covered mountain you're like falling and getting wet yeah. as fuck well but you just it, do it because it looks sick no i mean but i actually did the first like um waterproof jean right that okay. was like an actual snow denim you know and is that super common now yeah it's pretty common now right yeah um, yeah that must be a weird thing because like as a skater you could put on whatever fucking shirt you want whatever yeah. jeans you want for the most part and it doesn't really matter so like when you watch a video part that is a huge part of it is just like how is this dude choosing yeah, to present yeah. himself yeah exactly yeah, yeah definitely so okay you start kind of just doing the video part thing how long was your like total pro career because like you, you described it to me that you kind of just kept getting more and more into the fashion side of things and that kind of led to the end of it at some point um well it was actually kind of music that was it well it was injury mm, okay. injury was the end and i and i was probably around like 2004 i broke my back and uh and then I came back from that and then had an injury right after, blew my knee out, had to get knee surgery. And at that time, I was just like experimenting with music and I started really just recovering. I had met my wife and I was, she had like guitars and, and like music equipment laying around the house. And so I was in Philly at the time, like doing my rehabilitation and, and I was just killing time you know, writing some songs with her, like, and realizing, like, cause I've never been taught how to play music either. It was just like uh, playing like a single string riff or whatever, but like, I knew how to like translate a feeling and she would come in singing a melody and like some of those things ended up being songs. Um, and then I started doing it for myself and I bought an MPC and a four track tape recorder and just like started making my first record which i didn't know i was act this was like myspace era right and uh and i made a couple songs and planned to just kind of like put them in the drawer and and get back on my board and and uh like my wife and some friends around were like you know this is dope you should put this out and uh, my wife santi she actually made me a myspace page and put the stuff up and then it started like really especially from like the snow skate surf community people really started embracing it like bam used one of my songs for his video part and like some other snowboarders and surfers were using it and it just encouraged me to to do it more and so i started like getting more into that and even using the opportunities that were presented through snowboarding like oh we're going to this trade show I'm going to pull up and do a, a show there or whatever. And, um, and then, so I just started making music and, uh, I was in New, we moved to New York and I had formed a band and we were playing like underground spots in LES and Brooklyn and, and, uh, and a lot of like the skate community and punk community were like, definitely, um, you know, giving me that love and, and that allowed me to just, keep pushing it you know what, what genre did you consider yourself to be making at that time like 
sort of like post punk type yeah kind of it was kind of like genre breaking to be honest there wasn't like a whole lot that sounded like it at the time um, right. my first song i ever wrote was called chase money and it I was kind of uh you know it was me on the mpc and and doing a little riff on the the guitar it was yeah kind of like post-punk synth wavy right. type of stuff just kind of like going with the punk aesthetic but not necessarily being like married to a specific style in a way like yeah. you're just trying to fuck with it a little bit and experiment. yeah like breaking it down a little bit mm. because like i wasn't like i didn't have i wasn't just trying to be like punk i was i was kind of mashing some of those ideas like making the beats on an mpc and like playing it really and they were like really melodic they were more but they were definitely inspired by that first stuff was inspired by the the, the music i was learning through the skate videos and stuff like those underground bands like sub society and right. and mcrad and that kind of skate rock wave and so did you feel like the music side of things was appreciated by your snowboard fans oh for sure it was yeah it was it actually really was and i feel like that's as far as my music career really went was it was like snow skate surf mm. you know like people knew about it and i would pull up to like a skate party or whatever and 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 play but um you know there wasn't i i don't think like on a mainstream level like it was really underground you right. know it was uh, but in your head at any point where you're like i'm gonna make this huge like i'm gonna, I'm gonna make this the focal point of my life is to just be the biggest musician possible um i think maybe like i think make it as big and as honest to what it was like i knew that what was getting played on the radio and what was really like hitting at that time wasn't like what i was doing i think i was like breaking trail for something that mm. was to come later down the road um and to me like that's dope like when riff hits me up and is like yo man your shit should be fucking huge or whoever like that means a lot to me is more about the respect and uh and you know i think that when you make something with like real intention you really it always finds its way and it's time it doesn't have to happen in your time it, like sometimes it happens after you're dead you know mm. what i mean it's just like uh but when i was making it and i'm still making music but like when i make something whether it's a painting music clothing uh film whatever digital art it's finding that moment where you truly are losing track of time you're you loving what you're doing you're not just doing it for like i want to get rich or i want to get it's like you're doing it because it it feels honest and i think that that will always be felt and it's just sometimes it's not like i said in your time like right. it 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 just or it'll influence somebody else to like do something that um you know so like that's how i look at it but that's interesting cuz whether it's music or art or whatever there's there's always people who just 100% go to what they think will make them huge right and it's like very hard to pull that off and still maintain like the integrity that people kind of need to see to really right. fuck with you as an artist versus people who also like we we probably all could name skaters bike riders rappers etc who are totally uncompromising and there is a pocket of people who really respect their contribution but the for the most part they did so anonymously because right. they just weren't necessarily going to make those concessions and then you have somebody like jay-z who was like you know probably one of the best rappers of all time but or definitely the best rapper of all time in my book but you know he made countless compromises to make his songs fucking huge so that he could become the billionaire he is now i mean it's like that's almost like every artist's choice at, at a certain point right yeah and i think that i like at the time of being really in it like would have accepted like that kind of i like collaborating so i think mm -hmm. even when you collaborate with somebody you're somewhat compromising because your initial vision is getting split so like i'm down for that but uh i think yeah i just i just make stuff and and just keep making stuff and keep throwing different things at the wall and i and i think that it all works together as like um for just how 
I'm viewed as an artist and and uh, the sincerity of what I do. It's like I just is is that tunnel vision that you were describing of just getting completely lost and working on something is that actually the goal for you like in terms of like that lets you know what you should be chasing in life for sure like that's what i always follow it's just that that um i don't know it's just a feeling Mm -hmm. and like sometimes i guess it's just always led me to success it's led me to be able to live a life as an artist Mm -hmm. you know what i mean so like that's what I've always followed and and some things are different you know like I collaborate with artists but I also collaborate with brands and corporations and like I understand the dynamic of that as well creating like a product or an identity or like reimagining a brand like that I don't know if it feels fun and it's and it's not something that's like this is dishonest and and corny and I'm just doing it for a check like I don't do that Mm. I just I've been lucky that I've had uh, the gigs that I've had and that have allowed me to just provide for my family and live a life of as an artist, a creative. But it's know? interesting because you're you're saying that you basically just chase fun and pure pleasure and enjoyment, but a lot of people do that and it leads them to become fucking meth heads under a bridge somewhere. You know, like yeah. you like it, you have to be like willingly pursuing the things that bring you joy but then also be able to differentiate between what's like a short-term uh you know pleasure seeking right. arrangement oh, versus sure. what is like creating something but definitely and that's you know being an artist and living that way i definitely know my limitations as far as you know like it's it could be like a slippery slope so i don't i know myself and i know that i obsess on things so it's like that's why you know you won't catch me doing meth you know what I mean? <laughs> you just know you're not an optimal meth user yeah. yeah no that's part of what fucking blows my mind when i come in here it's my second time here but it's just like there's so much evidence everywhere of you just being in that mental state of just zoning the fuck out and clearly just going crazy creating something that might not even really have a purpose aside from just looking fucking cool and somebody's right. gonna find joy in it and want to own it yeah and that's it it's like not I think the purpose is the 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 process. Mm. You know what I mean? The process is definitely the purpose and and then be through that intention and I think that somebody can look at it and go that's dope, you know, right. like that's unique or I I feel something from that, you know? I feel like I would feel overwhelmed. If this if I had your life I feel like I would be overwhelmed by the possibilities and the fact that I can only really like make my hands do one thing at one time. Is that like, do, is that a feeling that you deal with a bit? Um, not really. I think that, uh, like I said, I jump from one thing to another and, and, um, I've got a good team of people around me that like I assign projects to. And, um, like, I think that I, I really like to, mix it up so that it everything always stays fresh to me you know mm. what i mean it's like i'll work on a video project and then um you know i'll be delivering some graphics for like a collaboration and then doing some fashion stuff like and conceptualizing some new art piece or i like that i like to stay busy man because it's like a lot of can you know you're if you don't stay busy it's i, th- I feel like that's what's dangerous for me is to mm not be occupied and not you know so it's like i have a family and that keeps me occupied and healthy and and i the art keeps me busy and healthy and um so yeah do you ever find yourself in the the position where you're like financially incentivized to sort of churn out copies of one thing that you've kind of already done that you know people want and is that is that a tough decision sometimes where it's like you could just make a lot of money or you could chase the things that you're really passionate about that who knows, maybe they don't make much money. Right. Um, well, I don't feel like I churn it out in a sense. I definitely, even when I do release something like a screen print, I keep it really, I don't release more than 50 Mm. and I do it. Uh, I do a different one every time. I never do a repeat. Um, but even with like the Gucci Ghost project, which we haven't really talked about, but like that, you know, I've been doing for 10 years and that does well for me. But like, 
I'm ending it. You know what mm. I mean? And I'm ending it probably when the well's the fullest for me, but I'm doing it because it just feels like the moment to do it. And uh, because I'm just doing other things, you know what I mean? It's right. just, it's just honest. It's just like, and the way that, you know, like this final piece that I've created um, is I believe the most progressive way that I could tell a story about that. You okay. Know? We will get into all the, sure. that stuff 100% yeah. for sure. But let's just, uh, so, okay, your, your snowboarding career ends essentially why? Well, there's the injuries the and injuries everything, and but then, then the art just becomes a bigger and bigger part of your life to the point where it's kind of the whole thing. Well, yeah, it was kind of the music. And right. then, uh, and then I started a project called Gucci Ghost, which was actually a record. Okay, so and it was a song first. It was a fr it was okay. an EP. It was an EP okay. that um, the first Gucci Ghost piece w ever made was an EP, and um, and then I started creating like this visual identity around it to bring focus to it. So I was it really started. I went to the Philippines. I was DJing a party for my friend, and. Uh, I was leaving. It was right before Halloween. I went to the market and there was some bootleg Gucci fabric. And I always was like into like, I was never into like Gucci proper, like going to the Gucci store or whatever. Action sports and like designer fashion did not overlap. Yeah, it at was all like I was wearing time. Dickies and, right. and going to the thrift store, the Salvation Army with my mom, you know, and like and cutting stuff apart and sewing it back together and stuff like fine. But, uh, so basically, yeah, I, I bought this bootleg fabric. I came home to New York. I didn't have a costume. I just cut eye holes in the fabric and skated around New York as Gucci Ghost. And like, I was fascinated by the fact that people immediately were like, Gucci Ghost, before it was a thing. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that kind of, and I was simultaneously working on this record, you know? And so I started drawing this Gucci ghost and then I started like painting it and doing wheat paste around the city and like painting trash cans and like dragging stuff into my studio and transform my whole studio and all my clothes I was wearing, I was like painting. And, and it was really an effort to like extract some power from the brand, something really familiar to people. Cause I was fascinated that people would like stand next to a trash can and take a photo, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Or like a wall where it was like, I, I just thought that that was really interesting. And it reminds me of Dapper Dan. Well, yeah. Because I mean, he was making his own versions of all this designer shit, which from our modern day perspective of it, it's kind of like, oh, that's copyright infringement. But at that time he had all the flyest dudes, drug dealers, et cetera, in New York, just dying to get his custom well, designer. And shit. he was reimagining the brand. Yeah. You know, he was bringing silhouettes that didn't exist. He was bringing like a whole, he was bringing something that, uh, that now they want of course <laughs> yeah. yeah of course um and they see you yeah. know uh but yeah at that time i was just putting the stuff in the street like really doing it in this really stripped down raw way where i was breaking it apart i wasn't using this perf perfect version of the logo i was like doing it in this really messy way and spray painting it and really like a punk rock energy behind it and um, and that was really just to bring people into me as an artist and what I was doing with the record and what I was doing with the, you know, like just as an artist period, like, and, um, it wasn't with the intention to actually reach the brand at all. I right. didn't like, I didn't start the project to get at Gucci and, but at a certain point I definitely was like, damn, they should do this. You know, right. I was doing it for like three years. And had you done much street art before you started doing all that wheat pasting and stuff? No. It, th this concept was so inspiring to you that you just started going outside the box of what you had done before? Yeah, and it was it was everywhere. It wasn't just like street. It was like in the studio or on the internet or like in a film. Like I would kind of inject this this mascot or this identity into it to just on every like medium that I was working on with art just to like bring people into what I was doing because I felt what I was doing was somewhat influential to the influential people around me, you mm -hmm. know? And um, so I just kept going 
really full steam on that and obsessing on that. And, uh, you know, at a certain point I did think to myself, like, they should do this. And everyone's telling me, oh, Gucci will never fuck with you. You know, like, they don't light their own cigarettes. Like, they <laughs> don't collab. They've never collaborated with a, uh, an artist. And you're not a famous artist. So, like, it's not going to happen. And you're just going to get sued. Mm. And then I was like, shit, I'm just going to do this till they sue me or hire me. Because at that point, then I know... Like I'm really affecting something, and I have nothing. Like sue me, go ahead. You like know them I mean? suing you would probably get you a big fucking news cycle that would have brought a exactly. shitload of attention to you. Anyway, it's like protesting and then getting arrested. Exactly. Because if you protest and you don't get arrested, it's like realistically, how many people are going to know that you were protesting happened. in the first yeah. place? Yeah. But was there okay? One way of looking at it is like, this is amazing that I'm able to sort of like use a version of their branding and be able to get such a reaction from people and people are so drawn to it. Was there ever the other side of it going on in your brain where it's like, I'm doing a fuckload of free promotion for a brand that realistically has yet to show me any kind of attention? Not really, because I felt like I was creating my own brand mm. and I was doing it with or without them anyway, you know, and it was really just, uh, I felt like it was just something of the times and it felt, honest to me and and again like a lot of people around me told me not to do it and why are you doing this and you can't like you know even the closest people to me were like oh you should st when are you gonna stop painting gucci on everything and like but i was i don't know i felt like it was i don't know i just felt compelled to do it because it just felt honest and i was having fun with it it mm. was like i was coming home like yo check out this whole gucci house i painted or like <laughs> check out these this whole row of trash cans and like and then i was started doing paintings as well where it was like i was really kind of channeling this my own energy and like reimagining the brand and doing these life is gucci paintings or like the casper stuff or you know um and it just it was just fun and and uh so I just kept doing it and then right. eventually yeah cuz cuz yeah before we get to you actually collaborating with them it's kind of like multiple ways you could think about designer fashion and I'll admit that like at many times in my life I've pretty much just gravitated towards like this is bullshit that massive corporations trick people into spending ridiculous amounts of money on yeah and I do kind of see it as like a sickness almost for a lot of people where they are not at a financial point in their life where they can afford it and they end up just trying to sort of keep up with their peers and everything by buying expensive clothes and stuff. And then I guess the other way of viewing it is just like, these are some of the most incredible brands that we've had. If you if you like the idea of brands, if you're fascinated by, you know, a Supreme or a whatever, then I mean, this is like, these are brands that have been being built for hundreds and hundreds of years that have basically accomplished a level of elitism in society that almost no brand could ever hope to get to i mean yeah. th there's got to be a, a real fascination about that yeah, and, it's a and bit of both it's built in because why the fuck are you getting such a reaction when you start painting is because this does hold a lot of prestige in a lot of people's minds for sure and it did even in my own mind mm. I, I guess i'm a victim of that own my, that sickness as well where it was like you know that's why i would go to canal street and buy like a fake gucci um dicky suit type thing or like buy even like fake Jordans to skate in because I was like I don't want to actually buy that shit but I want to I want to have it because it looks dope and my heroes are wearing it you mm -hmm. know what I mean so it's a bit of both and and I definitely was aware of that when I started it and that's why I really once I noticed how people were responding to it I'm like okay I'm going hard with this like you know because it was I could I could feel people's reaction to it you know? right so how do you end up actually making contact with them so um yeah like three years into the project um i uh well it actually goes back to my snowboarding days actually which is kind of crazy um there's a photographer uh by the name of ari mercopolis and uh he he shot like a lot of the early like Supreme and Harmony Corinne and like Basquiat and like he was around the New York scene. I actually didn't know this when I first met him. He came, he was at the contest that I won the $50,000. Oh, wow. 
he did this book there. He was like shooting snowboarders. He was like following snowboarders around because he thought it was fascinating, like the way that we were living our lives. And and he made this book. And um, so he came on a couple trips. Fast forward, I hadn't seen him in like maybe 10 or maybe 15 years or something. I was living in New York and uh, Halloween, the night that I'm skating around with Gucci Ghost, I was actually with the ATL twins. And uh, <laughs> you got a lot of cool friends over the years, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was with them and we went to this party and I ran into Ari and I was like, yo, Ari, it's Trev. We reconnected. He started coming to my studio, hanging out and shooting photos and whatever. He got commissioned by Gucci to shoot their lookbook in 2016. He was over there and Alessandro, who is the new creative director who brought Ari there. He was like, man, you ever hear my friend Trevor Andrew Gucci Ghost? Like, and he showed him some stuff. And then they immediately started blowing me up. Like, hey, you got to come to Rome. My phone was dead. I turned on my phone. There was like 20 texts like, hey, call us back. We want to collaborate with you. Like, and, you know, like two weeks later, I was in Rome and I brought like three years of work, like all jackets and canvases and hard drives and like all this stuff and just rolled it into the office and at Gucci and like they opened up the bags and it was just like the gold rays like shining out of the bags and everyone's pulling out the stuff and because I didn't know what they actually I thought maybe they would do a scarf or something you know right but and just doing my my drippy G's or whatever and like it ended up being like you know like 75 percent of that collection that first collection and and now you know fast forward six years it's like still still getting gucci ghost rings in the store and whatever it sounds like a fucking acid trip to be just like going around spray painting this shit on walls and stuff and then to all of a sudden be in rome and to have the this actual brand like the most prestigious like most impossible to imagine them reacting to almost anything it's like when you think about their brand they just fuck with the shit that they apparently want to fuck with and there's yeah. no explanation there's no like you, you can never guess what they're going to do next it kind of feels like like for you as artists like what is going through your fucking head as they're just like instantly validating all this shit that you had put together over the years that must have been insane it was insane it was insane um it was exciting and it was like it definitely it happened really fast and you know looking back on it you always see it differently like oh man but the truth is like i i really my intention was just to like use them as a vessel to like bring my art to the surface you know what i mean so i would have done it for free at mm. the time you know what i'm saying like right. but uh but it, it was exciting because I was like, had all these ideas and they were listening to me. I had my own office, you know, and it was like, uh, you know, and I had my own assistants and like, so it was just really nice to be valued in that moment. All that work and all that believing in what I was doing, it was, you know, there was a group of people there that obviously are like one of the biggest fashion houses in the world that were like, we really want to listen to you. Nobody told me like what to do. Nobody said, oh, you know, like, and, and you know, Alessandro, I got to give it up to him because he was really fearless in the same way of like bringing me on because he had just gotten his job as the creative director. I wasn't a famous artist. It wasn't like they were hiring Banksy or something. And he really just believed in it and understood what I was doing and just gave me like free reign to do whatever. And it was fun. It was like skateboarding in the parking lot with your friends on a curb and everybody just pushing each other. Like I was, you know, painting down in my office. He would come down, I'd be playing music. He would take some of the pieces that I had done, bring them back up to his spot. Then he would be like adding patches or linings to things and trying them on models. And it was just like, it was really fun. And it was, it was, and I think that that's why it's been so successful for them. And I think that that's why it really kind of educated them in a way of the, how they can work with other artists. As exactly. Well. You know, and that was like one of my first things when I was there is to like, got to work with Gucci Mane. You know, you got to <laughs> work with like, I wanted 
or Dapper Dan, like all like because to me, those guys are my heroes. You know what I'm saying? And and I knew that they it so um, it was exciting. And then to bring all my friends into it and be like, oh, we're doing a Gucci world tour to all the Gucci stores around the world and we're going to throw parties and DJ and bring my friend to DJ and bring my other friend to film and like, you know, and, and just like making it our thing and taking over their spot. And, and they were really welcoming for, uh, to make that happen. And, and it was, it was just a really good time, you know? Wow. And so like, I mean, you're being able to be as creative as you want to make all this stuff, but then it kind of has to get distilled down into like a couple of items per season or like, how does that work? Like for them to kind of be like the final say of what actually is going into right. production. That must've been different. Cause before it was just all you. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, I'm like, whatever, use whatever you want. I don't care. Like, but they had racks and racks, like all these jackets you see, like a lot of these are, you know, the archive pieces and some of the first ideas. Um, but yeah, I was down for whatever. Like I said, I was like, I thought they might just do a scarf or something, you know? It must have been a surreal feeling that you were a bootlegger. This is not an experience that any bootlegger. But I wasn't a bootlegger. Right, you weren't, but you kind of. I was a reimagining. You, you were dabbling in that kind of stuff. And then for it to go from that to like, this is an official Gucci thing. Just because they said so. Now this jacket that previously would have been a, you know, an interpretation or whatever. Yeah. Is an official Gucci thing. Like that's yeah. just so bizarre to think that their approval could kind of take a, a physical item and completely shift yeah, the narrative. Yeah, for sure, it could take a jacket that someone's like nice fake Gucci jacket <laughs> to like right. make it a real thing. But then it's also, I think, what's interesting about it is, so is the Gucci version of that the real one, or is it the original version of that the real one? Because the original is the original painting. The one that they made and put the tag in mm. is like a screen print. It's just a replica, right. you know what I'm saying? So I think that that, I've always been fascinated about that whole conversation of like, what's real as well. I think what's real, that's why I wrote real on the bag. Mm. That was the first bag I did when I went to Gucci and I wrote real on it. I remember they brought in a bunch of bags and I just wrote real on it. Cause it was like, now it's real to everyone but then I was obviously playing off of the real and fake and bootleg and stuff like that. But it, to me, it was me saying, now you can all see this as it's something that's real. It was real to me the whole time, you mm. know what I mean? Because I believed in it that much. And that's why I believe that it manifested itself into what it has, you know? And it's, it also makes me think of when certain countries I've been to in Asia and shit where there's there is no real version of something, but there's infinite fake versions of it. So it's like, at that point, is this even fake? If there is no real version right. out here? I, I was so hyped too when I went to China for the first time and went to the market and saw my bootleg stuff. Wow. I was like, I really made it. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that's like real proof that somebody really is yeah, fucking with Yeah, I was like buying shit. it all. Cause I was like, this is, this is like even, more special to me than the real thing you know right for sure so how long does this uh would you call it like a, a honeymoon phase or is there there's they, they they embraced you and kind of let you go wild for how long and like how does this sort of unfold i mean i'm still going wild you right. know but uh it's it's been like six years i guess mm. um and it's taken lots of gucci ghosts has like had so many different like kind of uh lives within that time where it's yes it started with with the brand it started with like the clothing and then you know and then we went to jewelry and watches and jewelry is still in the stores now um and then we went to digital and we were doing like some digital stuff together mm. and um and now yeah like and then i've it's gone to galleries and museums you know i did like and some of the stuff is independent of gucci you know and they've just always been like really supportive of what I am doing as an artist independently as Gucci Ghost, you know, and telling that story. Cause to me, the most important thing was to like share that journey. Cause I think most people, they discovered Gucci Ghost through the brand and they don't really know like how it started and how it started so modestly. Mm. And, and it was like all these different mediums that I was using to tell this story. So when I've been doing gallery shows and museums, I've been really sharing that story and that art 
to bring perspective of like, oh, like that's where it started with this guy that was doing all this stuff, you know, because mm. I think it's inspiring and I want other people to, you know, have that courage to to kind of if you believe in something, just fucking go for it. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that it got me hyped on what you're doing is that with a lot of these designer brands, obviously they're the furthest thing from like a first generation brand where if you start a company tomorrow, everybody knows you're the dude who started it. You're the dude who, who thought it up. And it's, it's kind of like easy to understand a brand when you could see it from its conception. Whereas like all Gucci or any other like big brand, I mean, it's been bought and sold multiple times and yeah, it's kind of hard to, and that's like the same reason why people say like I, I i steal from corporations i won't steal from an individual right because you keep like i mean a corporation still is something owned by a bunch of individuals but it's been like obscured to them like how this is a bunch of individuals and with you it's kind of like oh we got to see like a reimagining of the brand by somebody who is you know you get to see it from the ground up in a way yeah for sure mm. and and you know along that journey at the same time i've been building my own brand real by which was actually came out of my first art show that i ever did in new york at milk it was insane it was like so fun like what year did you first start using that name uh that was in 2017 maybe and was this like a reaction to them like i kind of imagine i don't know if it's true that maybe at a certain point either you realized or they kind of told you like if you're going to be making real Gucci stuff, you can't necessarily be selling shit yourself that has some of these drawings on them. Well, yeah, I mean, I can sell art. It, art, it's my right to interpret the world as I see it as an artist. But as far as clothes and stuff, I reserve that for my collaboration with Gucci. I right. don't go out and try to sell, you know, make my own brand version of it. I made my own brand real buy, right? right? And real buy was not really a reaction to them saying that. It was just like it was just, it was the title of my first art show. And it was a react, it was what I was saying was, it's real by me, you know what I mean? And it's like brands, they grab what is, you know, they often collaborate with artists because artists bring something that's very real and authentic and relatable to the brand. So I wanted to do this real by play on that and we did some t-shirts and stuff at the first thing and it was like people were really uh you know into it so i was like oh let's let's push this further and um and then you know with i just did a museum show last year and uh it was like a overview of my whole life as an artist it was at the modern art museum in shanghai and i did all this crazy sculpture stuff i had like five different rooms one was like dedicated to my street stuff one was dedicated to my music stuff. One was dedicated to like my studio. Another was dedicated to, I did a store that was like my brand and it was the real buy store. And we just made all this crazy stuff like jackets and pants and whatever. And then I went to Paris Fashion Week and did all that. And it was just started to happen naturally. And, uh, and so that's been fun too, you know, and to be able to like have my own inventory of stuff and hooking my friends up and the, you know, skaters and snowboarders and stuff that I think are rad and give that kind of same support out that I received as a kid, you know, is 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 a cool place yeah, to be. I was interested when I saw that you had a booth at like Complex Con. Oh yeah, that was fun. And yeah. that kind of made me think like, I wonder what the future of the real buy thing is going to be. Like, could he see himself? doing a lot of these more sort of like mainstream like consumer friendly fashion type things like do do you look at other brands is there any brands that you look at that you could kind of imagine it being similar to over the years uh i don't even know or is it more of an art project in your head it is kind of an art project i feel like the brand is about the art and it's like about creating experience you know that's why i loved the complex con thing it was really fun just because it was just a place to like create an experience and you know my friend was tattooing and like my other friends were working there with me and like we were I made a bunch of like one of one stuff here on the floor and like everything even when I like do uh, a print run of the shirts or whatever it all starts with like just making something on the floor and like making it in a real artful way mm. so I, I just I don't I think it's kind of its own thing you know right how much of your time does it take and like do you do you have a vision for it, like hiring employees and really kind of like making it 
start operating on its own or or is it more just like you feel like doing something you do it yeah well up until like literally like last week i've been just doing it in the same way that i'm like just doing it because i'm it's fun Mm. and uh again i always find the right people or they find me or something because i'm doing it and i have some partners now and i've got like an infrastructure to like really bring this more to the world more more outside of my studio you Mm. know what i mean and uh and that's rad like i think for me it's all about sharing the art and the experience and the story whether it's with the paintings or with the clothing or with the music it's just like sharing it and um having it reach as many people as possible i think that that's the goal so if but if you want to be a really prolific artist if you want to really make an impact on the culture you as an adult like do you look at it and you're like you have to have other people involved to help you deal with the business of it um i mean i do a lot of the business myself i have a lawyer um and i have a team of people that help you know i've got like a little factory going on where it's like um i assign uh tasks but um i think yeah each thing has to have legs behind it it's got to have some muscle behind it in a certain you know i couldn't have built like a 30 foot high microwave that was like a mini gallery to some of my paintings in china if i didn't have a bunch of people around me that are like when i'm like i want to build a a giant microwave like I need you, I couldn't have done that myself. You know what I mean? But how I, much do you need to be involved in order for it to still feel like your work? Um, well, just the c- conceptual part of it. You mm. know what I mean? Like it's just like an idea like that. I don't know how to build a giant microwave, but like I know the microwave over there that's that I heat my coffee up in every day is the perfect thing to replicate. So I'm like just replicate this microwave and make it as big as this room mm. and hang my paintings in it and it came out perfect you know? right so. no for sure it's just kind of like crazy to think about like because i mean i feel like once you get to like because you hear stories like i'm sure you've heard way more and know more way more about it when you hear about like really successful artists who just end up in this crazy fucking position of being able to make so much money and they have all these assistants working under them and helping uh-huh. them to do everything like is that something that you fully embrace or is it something that you're have a little bit of trepidation about uh, dipping your toe no, into becoming it. that dude. I embrace it. I love it. I love to have help because I, I'm completely secure in in the fact that I know that I can translate an idea or I can make sure that it's it's authentic. But I know that it takes a village sometimes, you know. Mm. And it's like for the the scale of things that I want, I'm trying to do with my career. You know, it's, it's, I look at people like Andy Warhol, you know, it's like, I'm trying to do that. Like, Mm. I'm trying to go as big as possible. And, and sometimes that starts with just making something on the floor or doing a sketch or whatever, but it takes a group of people that understand what I'm trying to do. Just like Alessandro understood what I was trying to convey with the fashion and bring it to the world, you know? So I'm always like welcoming that kind of help because, uh, I'm trying to go big, you know? Right. Yeah, you can't get big without getting a little bit of assistance at some point. For sure. Some people might have caught it earlier. You're married to Santi Gold. Santi Gold, yeah. Santi Gold, whoops. Yeah, uh, no, that's all good. When did you meet her? How did that unfold? Because this is way before she became kind of like a household name at one point, right? Yeah. Um, I met Santi uh, in New York. I was actually snowboarding. It was before... It was like uh, two thousand three ish or something right. before I had my big injury, but uh, I'd met her because I was at this magazine. I was hanging out in New York because we were doing like a uh, a promotional tour um, for the snowboard brand, and uh, so we did like a party and like showed the snowboard video or whatever. And I was hanging out at this spot called Fridge Magazine because I had some friends there, and it was kind of like it became Frank One Five One. Oh wow! Uh, but previous to that it was this the guys from there um at fridge it was kind of like a snowboard skate fashion hip-hop graffiti like it was just a culture magazine um so when i would pop into new york i would hang out with those guys and santi was in town from philly she was she had a band called stiffed 
it was like a punk rock band and she was doing her first photo shoot and she had just made her demo tape i was leaving the office and my friend was like yo my friend seth was like yo um stay my friends picking me up we'll drop you off at the hotel and it happened to be santi and she was playing me her demo tape all shy about it and i was like wow this is dope and then you we, believed and, right away huh you believed right away i did i really? did um i was like uh and we just had like a lot in common and we were talking about music and i the one thing was crazy because i was like we were talking about music and i was saying rare bands that i knew nobody fucking knows and I was like, oh yeah, one of my favorite bands is, is McRad. And she was like, oh yeah, Chuck, that's my drummer. And I'm like, what? And um, so I left the next day for Switzerland and I was in Switzerland for like two months filming my video part and we just stayed in touch and I ended up getting hurt and I went back to Philly. And then, yeah, here we are like 20, 20 years, years later. <laughs> <laughs> How many years after that did she blow up? And I assume that that puts a lot of strain on a relationship. But did you guys just keep it together? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because I, I feel like in our journey, it's been like a lot of like when she's up. Yeah. Maybe I'm like we've supported each other. So like we uh, and I've always been really excited for her and she's been excited for me. So um, and, you know, that's what she wanted. And I wanted for her too, you know, she was an amazing, uh, the music she was creating at that time was like something new. And it was, it was, um, once she started Santi gold, it was like, I mean, I'm a big fan of stiff too. I love the stiff mm -hmm. records, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was something she really wanted. And, and, and it was rad to see it happen in her life too, for her to have that vision and to go hard with it and, for it to manifest itself into her making that her life, you know? Was she just like nonstop on the road and having to do a million different things for this? Like, is there like a period in your memory of the relationship that was kind of chaotic because she was just being pulled in so many directions for a few years? Not really, because I think that I was always used to that life too, because mm -hmm. I was always traveling, snowboarding, and I was used to, so it was exciting to me to, oh, we're going to the UK to do something. Oh, cool, I'm right. rolling, like whatever. And then once we had kids, you know, it was cool too because we were pre-pandemic like rolling around on the the tour bus with our first son and and um and then I would be doing art stuff and we would kind of just be yeah, it was like a nice balance, you know. That's some commitment. You went 12 years before you had a kid or yeah. so. Yeah. And and then 4 years before you went for it again. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. That's, <laughs> yeah. a, that's a crazy trajectory right yeah, there. Most people real. don't wait that long and they don't wait that long in between. And most people just don't make it that long. <laughs> Facts. You yeah. know? Um, but yeah, we've uh, we've been lucky and um, we, we chase our dreams and we support each other in that way. And I feel like most of the people in my life are people that I see doing the same thing. You know, I see them chasing their dreams and, and I guess that that's how we're all attracted to each other and we support each other. And I mean, my brother, my older brother, he's, uh, you know, a game designer. He always loved video games and was just, he made that his life. He moved out to the West Coast and started working for like EA and Ubisoft and mm. all these, now he's working with a new brand. And um, yeah, my younger sister, Maggie, she's working on music. Um, my younger brothers, they're, they learn Japanese and they live in Japan and teach English and do it. So it's like, and then all my friends, they're, I feel like I just have a bunch of rad people around me that are, that we all love and support and, and push each other to be great. And definitely. So, yeah. Um, becoming a dad, did that change a shitload in your life? Like what, what what was your life like prior and after in broad strokes? Yeah, for sure. I mean, becoming a father definitely changes everything. But I think that the biggest thing that it changed for me from my old way of living is just having some kind of sense of time. Mm -hmm. I never knew what fucking day of the week or month it was. I still kind of don't know. I do know the days of the week and I know that I got to get up at... <laughs> You know, I seven o'clock. I've to had to school. this problem for much of my life as well. <laughs> yeah. I never had a schedule until the past couple of years. Right. It was just whatever seemed fun. Yeah, exactly. So I guess that's the biggest change. And then just being a dad, I, I, 
I'm still me. That was my biggest fear about being a dad was just like I was afraid that it was going to change things so much that I wouldn't be able to be me. And it's like I'm me and I'm doing I'm more successful than I was previous to having a kid. I think it really let me know like how precious time is and how you've got to really if you want to do something, you got to like use that time wisely and then you have the other time to spend with your children and share all of the rad stuff that you're doing in your life with them you know it's like i'm just a big kid and i just you know i bring them to the studio and santi brings them on the road and we bring them to shows and um they're around a bunch of they're they're already i'm looking at them like wow like you're my favorite artists like Mm. they're exposed to so much and um and it's fun just to share that with them man i feel like every kid becoming aware of their parents profession is like interesting in a variety of different ways but the art thing must be like really fun to share with the kid because every kid's an artist i was just about to say right? everybody's an artist so yeah it's it's fun to really encourage that whereas i think that aside from like my mom being like as a kid like always getting me paper and stuff to draw on and you know me spending all that time like uh a lot of people in my life like teachers and friends i guess pe- other parents and stuff were always like it's unrealistic to be an artist mm-hmm. it's not um and so i it's the opposite with us we are like so encouraging where it's like i mean it doesn't matter to me if they become artists i just love to see them freely create and I just love it. It inspires me so much because the the things that they create and the way that they just are so free is is amazing. Because I that, think that's the part of your brain you're trying to tap into when you're of, working, right? Of course. That I think the that little e- kid. Every great artist is is trying to find that moment of complete where you're not like so influenced or there's no like there's no ceiling to something it's just it could be however it comes out it doesn't have to be like any way and Mm. i think that that is is just translating a feeling that's art you know right damn do the kids experiment with music a lot too yeah um recently when i was rehearsing with the band because we actually just did i did a show for the first time in like seven years really with prayers um and actually another artist alex sucks who i really like um i was just rehearsing at the house and they just jumped on the mics and like i had an instrumental going and they like just i was blown away by like the way that they translated their feeling onto the to the uh to the beat and um like my youngest son honor he really loves this band zulu it's like a have you heard them no uh la band hardcore band really Really? sick um but he was just like screaming on the mic and like uh it was it's rad it's it's just so pure and honest you know right it's interesting though because i feel like you can raise your kid to have the spirit of an artist but in some way that might at a certain point make it harder for you to get them to just like go to fucking class or like have a part-time job or whatever like when you bring them up in this atmosphere where everything is fun and creative i feel like i'm already experiencing that with like really yeah they're like i don't want to go to school (laughs) right (laughs) because like i feel you (laughs) (laughs) like you're not able to hide the fact that like yeah i wouldn't want to either if i were you yeah 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 but um i imagine like early you being like just How working the fuck are you not sweating bro it's so oh hot it is hot as lights. shit yeah hey man <laughs> <laughs> we're almost done but all good this, the one thing i imagine is i imagine like you doing art all night a lot of times back in the day uh-huh. now i imagine you being on like much more of a tight schedule oh, yeah. like I, I imagine your younger self just kind of like working all night and and just going crazy letting your creativity flow at all hours of the day. I assume that that's changed with uh, fatherhood. You on more of a schedule at this point. Yeah, for sure. So like I drop the kids off at school and then I, I come here. I'm usually here from like 10 to 2.30 and I really use that time to... Sometimes I don't actually, I don't force it either. Like if it doesn't feel like it's happening, I'll just like listen to some records or watch some films or make some calls or, 
just do something productive, um, feed my mind somehow. Mm. And, uh, and then sometimes I come back in the evenings, like maybe once a week or twice a week, but like, yeah, I definitely work on, on a schedule now. And I, I really use that time wisely, you know? Right. Yeah. It's probably gotta be like that. What, uh, you were actually just showing me earlier, we can slip some B-roll in here, uh, the virtual reality shit, like, yeah. like, so this is an NFT world that you're involved with. Explain how this all works to me. Yeah, so like a um, couple of years ago, the Winklevoss twins, the guys that started Facebook, right. they started a platform, uh, NFT platform, Nifty Gateway. I'm sure you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, you haven't? No, I have. Oh, okay. Um, I know everything about NFTs. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you talking to Gary Vee, so I, I'm yeah, yeah. He certain put me you on. know a little bit. I still haven't copped that V friend, though. Word. Got to give me a Pelican um Puffing. so so these guys they reached out to me and said hey we're starting this platform nifty gateway and we want to for you to be one of the first artists to come out and do an nft and i was like what's an nft and like nobody really knew what an nft was at that time and um i was just like i just welcomed it because i just saw it as as almost like a new social media it was just another way to like connect my art with people and um so i was down and and i did a couple drops with them and i did a drop last march when everybody it was like nft was like the the biggest buzzword you know and it was it was um it was really a a crazy drop and uh and from then i wanted to create something where even when I first started, I was like trying to think I was way ahead of it where I was creating like my first NFT that never came out. Like the technology didn't even exist at the time. But so I ended up releasing like some more basic versions of of my translating my art to digital. And like but for this piece that I've been developing for the past year that I really like dumped a lot of even what I made into NF from NFT into this NFT. Mm. Um, it's it's an overview again like i was telling you about sharing the story you know i was supposed to do this big art show in la pre-pandemic that was going to be an overview to really show and give perspective to people of like how this project started and how far it's gone and how many different mediums i've used and whatever obviously didn't happen because of the pandemic and then that really in those moments really inspired me because i was like how could I still tell this story? How could I connect with people? So I start, I went back and I, st um, in 2017 at my old Brooklyn studio where all of the Gucci ghost project really went down and was conceptualized and created all the samples and everything. Um, I started like rebuilding that space digitally. Cause I had had it all scanned and archived. I had really do a good job of like archiving all the work that I make and, so during the pandemic, I started building this 3D space that was a replica of the actual original studio in Bed-Stuy, um, 118 Ralph Ave. So you were building it or how did you go about it? You have to work with somebody who helps you create the 3D scan of it yeah, and shit? Yeah, so I got like a rad digital team, my buddy Jim and, and um, Brian, they like, I basically was like, yeah, they had the digital scans of everything. So I'm like, yo, let's rebuild this thing. Let's put everything as it was. We looked at photos and everything that from that time. And um, and so we started building it. And, and in the past year, I completed this, this piece. And it's a one of one that is the original studio space that has all the original iconic paintings, objects, like everything that happened in that time and actually from the 10 years like i put in some newer pieces into this piece so it's a one of one that one person only one person or a group of people can get but then they can actually break it up and sell it individually so like each piece would disappear from the space as it sold just like because i wanted to parallel the real world i wanted to parallel like you come in here you saw the guy he just came in and he, they bought that painting and he just came and picked it up. Now it's gone it's, and it won't be here anymore. So I wanted to make that happen in the digital space. So every different painting I saw in there is basically represented by its own NFT. Yes. And then the space itself is an individual NFT as yes. well. Yes. 
Yes. Wow. So if somebody sold every single piece in there, then they'd be left with just the space. Right. You know, but uh, yeah, and it's it's really unique in the sense that it's tied to something that's actually real. It's you can look at the value of like, say, the paintings, the physical paintings, what they sell for. You could look at the value of like what you know, the art actually made for Gucci. Like there's, and you can look at the story and the time that it happened and go, this really, it's not only like a, a place in time, it's there's there's actual value. It's not some like Fugazi, like, oh, this is worth this much. It's like, no, it actually, you know, it holds a certain significance because it's something that really happened. And it's, and I think that there's, a place in NFT to like really bring something from the physical world and a physical, uh, like a real experience in a real time and place and like parallel it with the digital and and share that story. And and so that's gonna be the final piece. I'll never, once that sells, I'll never make another Gucci Ghost. I'll never do another clap. I'll never paint another, make another jacket, nothing. It'll be the last piece. And I've actually started on, even painting over some of my paintings and burning NFTs to like create such scarcity to protect the value of anybody that's collected my stuff and believed in me as an artist so that, you know, I'm almost creating the moment when an artist dies. There's just like no more. Right. So you, you are just going to Gucci like, Hey, it's been real, but I'm not making any more of this stuff. Yeah. Was that a tough, decision financially or you know just you built this relationship it's like it's kind of like being in a relationship with a girl like at a certain point you just have to hey it's over i'm sorry you know does yeah it, does well, it feel like that in a way well yeah well not really because i feel like i've existed as an individual this whole time it's not like mm. gucci ghost is just a thing with gucci you know gucci ghost has been a thing for 10 years three years before gucci was ever involved and it's been something that i've done as an individual and as an artist the whole time so it's more a moment of me saying hey like i have all these other things that i'm excited about right now i'm the most excited about this nft i believe it's the most progressive way for me to tell this story i don't see it's like the perfect project completion it's bringing it back to the origins of where it started it's like archiving and preserving that moment in time it's some real like back to the future shit because it's like we're going back, but we're actually going forward with technology. Right. So I just feel like, you know, Gucci Gucci Ghost has like taken so many turns that I didn't even expect over the ten years. But I believe in this moment, it's it's the final piece, and I just like am not afraid to take my next leap of faith and go. Okay, I'm doing this other thing now. Like where. You know, I'm, I've been doing a lot of other things the whole time anyway, but it's like, I feel like it's just another one of those moments like when I stopped snowboarding to do the music or when I stopped the music to do the, it's just like that, it's just an honest moment of me, me going, yo, this is, this is a completion and I'm ready to like move on. Right. I feel like in the overall internet space, there's maybe a lot of pessimism about uh, NFTs right now. Is that the same case in the art world? Because I kind of feel like the art world is like the best use case for a lot of the NFT stuff. Like the way that you talk about it is the way that if you were like somebody who wanted to invest in NFTs, that's exactly the mentality that you would want to have. Right. Whereas like a lot of these like influencers we've seen who do these crazy rug pulls and stuff, like it's not like they ever had the right mentality of like right. building a long-term brand through their art in the long run. Like how, how much do you think about that? Yeah, well, I mean, from jump, like I said, I just, I viewed it as a way to connect with people and I was just, you know, it's it's been honest because it's my art and it's just a way to translate it into the digital space, which I feel like I've done the whole entire time. Every time I make a piece, I take a photo of it. We upload it to social media. We do these digital kind of translations where I really, I fuck with it. I think it's awesome. I think there is, there was a lot of skepticism from the art world, um, you know, coming into this. Because I remember being one of the first artists coming out doing this, like, a lot of my peers that I'm like, dude, you you should do NFT. It's really dope. Like it's a it's its own medium. Like it's a really 
rad way to um, share your art and uh, and um, participated in, in it forever. And like a lot of people were like hesitant at first because they're like, but I'm like viewed as this fine mm -hmm. artist and how is it? But now it's like completely changed. You go to an art fair, you go to like a museum, you go to any like fine art establishment, there is a NFT component, Christie's, Sotheby's, like everybody's in the game because they know it's not going anywhere. It, NFT is gonna be a part of our future. It's gonna be not only just with art, it's gonna be a part of brand. It's gonna be a part of like just our access to, um, you know, to be a part of No Jumper. It'll be a part of everything. Like I, that's how I see it. And, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of people that jump in on the hype and they just try to make a quick buck and they're not really in it. They're not using it as a medium. They're not like pushing it forward. They're not like, just like people try to do with anything, music, mm -hmm. fashion, art, whatever. You see somebody that goes, oh, wow, like this person made a million dollars doing this. Oh, okay, I'm gonna do that same fucking thing or I'm gonna whatever and it's not, it's not authentic, it's not felt, it doesn't last, but NFT will. Mm -hmm. And the artists that are really um, using it correctly and are pushing it forward and being progressive, they will too. You Have know? you got to the point of buying NFT th NFTs from other artists? Um, I kind of trade, it's kind of like uh, artists yeah. trade, you know, like that makes sense. even like with paintings and stuff, I don't really buy too much. I'll, things that I like or people that I admire, we, usually yeah like make a trade you know mm, that makes sense for sure um so what are you excited about now and how do you how do you imagine the next 10 years of your life going down shit um well i don't really think that far ahead i i kind of i stay somewhat in the present moment but um just staying creative you know like living my life as a creative and coming up with ideas and having visions and chasing that and finding a way to bring it to life. You know, mm -hmm. that's my mission Definitely. in life and, and being a dad, you know? Yeah. The dad thing is fucked up because you spend your whole life building these things, whether it's, you know, you with the art or me with this podcast, whatever, like you build these things that realistically are very unique. You know, nobody else has had the career that you have or I had. And then you become a dad, which is one of the most common experiences for all right. humans throughout history. Uh -huh. Really not like me or you as dads. It's very simple in yeah. comparison to, you know, everything else that we've done, which is entirely unique. Yeah. But at a certain point, you're faced to realize you're forced to realize that the kids shit is more important than everything else that you've done creatively or whatever, even though it's for sure. This very, very incredibly common experience. Yeah, it's, you know? it's the yeah greatest creation ever that you can yeah it's 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 bigger than anything it's mm. bigger than everything i could never understand that before i had kids people talk to me about their having kids and i'd be like yeah anyway <laughs> yeah like whatever <laughs> but okay. like yeah it, it it's it's but everything that we've done as creatives um and entrepreneurs and stuff it does it's not as big but it's a part of providing and allowing our children to like you know live a certain life and being able to expose them to things and um which is super special and and i think like doing something unique in life that uh is is very inspiring to children you know mm. and breaking the mold of like the general society way of living a, your life that you have to like live within these boundaries and you know, I've kind of always gone against that. And maybe it was from being told I couldn't make that soccer team. I don't know. It's just uh, this is the way I'm living. Like to give a kid an incredible upbringing is, you know, that's one of the greatest things that you could do. Oh, you, that like, is. Even to just give your kid a decent upbringing yep. is an incredible gift to them because so many people that I have on the podcast have fucking horror stories about right. what their childhoods were like. So to have a, a childhood for your kid where they're able to travel and be exposed to art and all this creativity and everything, I mean, that's pretty much, it's pretty incredible. Like, cause then all that investment into showing them that stuff, then at some point you get to look at them as an adult and see what all that time and effort you put into them has kind of yielded in terms of their personality and what they're capable of. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Now we're talking about kids like yeah, a project. Yeah, I was just about to say, man, bro, <laughs> stop. Because people are going to be like, if they don't have kids, they're going to be like, Psh. Yeah. <laughs> no, no that's real, man. It's so real. And it is it is the most beautiful, inspiring thing to be a dad and to, to try to do the best for your children and not, you know, have them necessarily share the great things that you've experienced in your life and not the shitty, traumatic shit that you've gone through and, you know, do your best to just uh, be a great dad. 100%. If you had some advice for uh, creatives out there, whether it's music, art, whatever, like what would mm -hmm. be the words that you'd want to leave them with in, in terms of if they want to, you know, create something awesome out of their life? Right. Uh, well, I guess that the, the main thing I could say is just, and I said it earlier, is just uh, when you're losing track of time doing something, then you know that like you're going in the right direction and mm. you should probably pursue that and really go as hard as you can to find a way to get the people around you that you need around you to like bring that vision and that feeling that you have when you're like, man, I love doing this and bringing it to the surface, you know, because you can do it. It's just that sometimes, you know, it takes like getting a few people around you that that have that same mentality and they can see it in you too, where they, you know, you get that encouragement and you get that support and, um, and, and then just like be relentless and consistent and almost repetitive of till you get it. You know what I mean? hundred percent for sure. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, I appreciate Thank you, too. You so much. Yeah, of course. We've been wanting Pleasure. to do this for years. We did yeah. like a real life version of this conversation a few <laughs> years back. So <laughs> yeah. it's cool to get the on camera version. Cool, man. Yeah. It's my pleasure. No doubt, man. Come by anytime. Trouble, Andrew. Appreciate you, man. Yep. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Yes, most YouTube, definitely. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Fuck off. Like button. Appreciate y'all. <laughs>